Hey everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Demystifying the 2024 CDP Questionnaire. Uh, really excited about today's topic with the uh, questionnaire just opening. I'm sure it's it's very top of mind for a lot of folks on the call. Um, actually, I had a chance to be at the CDP conference in New York about two weeks ago. And yeah, I heard a lot of interesting perspectives from various organizations that are reporting to the questionnaire, certainly call it some concern or basically a lot of folks in that preparation phase and getting ready to understand what the new requirements are, understand the new questionnaire as a whole, and the brand new reporting system. So happy to dive into it today. Also, just at the, the top of the, this presentation, we do have a Q&A function throughout this session. Please feel free to add in any questions that you may have, and we'll do our best to answer them live. Any questions that we don't get to during this session, though, we will follow up and you will get to that question answered. I'm Mitch Voss, Senior Director of Sustainability here at Sustain Life. I'm on our technical and services practices here, over 10 years of experience in the sustainability space. And yeah, really excited to be joined by Hassam. Hassam, I'll pass it over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Mitch. Hi, everyone. Hassam Mukata here. I'm a Senior Sustainability Consultant here at Sustain Life, part of the sustainability services team. So, you know, helping and kind of engaging with clients on greenhouse gas inventory, setting your science-based target, and kind of helping you with your journey with sustainability reporting. And one of the main topics is CDP. So super excited to be here. Perfect. Thanks, Hassan. And just at the top, for those who are unfamiliar with Sustain Life, uh, we're a carbon accounting SaaS platform, and we focus on bringing companies out of Excel and enabling action decarbonization throughout their value chain. Uh, we have a suite of carbon accounting and auxiliary tools that really enable businesses to measure their emissions across scope one, two, three, set science-based targets, engage with suppliers, report to all the various frameworks that are out there, for example, CDP, and really drive meaningful progress across your value chain. So thanks for joining us today. And without further ado, we'll dive into it. For the agenda today, we'll start with just a brief overview of what is CDP, kind of the history of CDP. We'll go into key updates from the 2024 questionnaire. So things that I'm sure organizations that are reporting on the call are hopefully aware of, but just some of the things that we want to focus on and highlight for your various organizations. We'll go over CDP's activity classification system, provide some advice on how to prepare for that CDP reporting cycle, uh, talk a bit more about those that can help you with preparation and, and reporting through accredited solution providers, talk about strategies for addressing climate risk uh, as one of the key topics or key uh, focus areas within the CDP report and steps for a successful CDP submission. So high level and, and kind of just setting the stage, what is CDP? CDP was formerly called the Carbon Disclosure Project, but it's a reporting framework and tool that collects, collates, and evaluates what companies are doing in terms of sustainability. It was founded in 2000. It operates globally, and I would say it's one of the leading platforms in terms of data collection out there and works really hard to provide this data publicly to various organizations. And with that ESG integration and uh, the data that they do provide, reporting to CDP does, or you can opt for and, and get a carbon disclosure rating, which can then be shared freely and, and made available to folks like investors, your customers, your suppliers, to really increase transparency and provide that data throughout the value chain. That accessible reporting is a, a real key cornerstone. And I think one of the reasons that a lot of organizations do report to CDP, that transparency, again, makes it really easy for people to have access to this data and share it globally. For some of the key updates for 2024, I want to pass it over to Hassam to walk us through them. Awesome. Thanks, Mitch. Well, for the next few minutes, we will kind of delve into some of the pivotal updates to the 2024 CDP questionnaire here. So one of the most important thing with the 2024 CDP questionnaire is it's kind of designed to refine and enhance kind of the streamlined process of reporting to CDP. So these changes kind of reflect CDP's collective progress and the evolving kind of demands of the environmental landscape, right? So with kind of the new introductions of new standards and new regulatory uh, frameworks, CDP was kind of in that, uh, you know, required to actually adjust that questionnaire to, 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 to help kind of address some of these emerging trends in the environmental space. 
So one of the main changes with the questionnaire is the integrated questionnaire. First and foremost, the integration of separate questionnaires into a singular, singular comprehensive document marks a, a kind of a, a transformative shift in the environmental disclosure. So part of this year, CDP has streamlined the process by merging climate, water, and the forest disclosure disclosures into one unified uh, questionnaire. So you no longer have to disclose to three separate questionnaires for CDP. So what is the point of this? It, this kind of approach not only simplifies the data submission process, but it also kind of creates a, a more interconnected understanding of the environmental impacts and how each of those three topics kind of interact with one another. One of the, the kind of the, the more important items as well is kind of it eliminates some of the repetitive data entry and kind of reducing the complexity, which enables companies to actually focus on quality and coherence in their reporting, making it easier to actually address some of these interconnected environmental challenges on a more holistic basis, right? So just kind of having that deep understanding of how your company is performing across those three key areas. The next one would be the focus on SMEs, which are small and medium-sized enterprises. So one of the, one of CDP's more important things was to actually turn its attention to being more inclusive, right? So part of the 2024 updates, it placed a significant focus on SMEs. We all know that SMEs, so SMEs are now kind of provided with a tailored section within the questionnaire which reflects kind of CDP's commitment to support all of the business, regardless of all their sizes and their sustainability journeys. And we also know that CDP uh, SMEs play a critical role in decarbonization. So that was kind of CDP's focus here is to actually provide a more inclusive questionnaire that SMEs can use. So this, again, this section ensures that smaller or SMEs are not overwhelmed by the complexity of the detailed reporting that may be more manageable for larger corporations. And it also empowers SMEs to report effectively and highlighting their kind of unique challenges and contributions to sustainability. One thing to note on the SMEs is, the, is that the questions will just be focused on climate change. So, you know, forest and water will not be a, like a focus topic for SMEs here or kind of the new guidance for SMEs. The final major topic with the 2024 CDP is its alignment with standards and regulatory frameworks. As I mentioned earlier, this, the environmental space is ev rapidly evolving with kind of new emerging standards, such as the TNF, uh, the SEC ruling, CSRD, California, and so forth. CDP was required to actually kind of align with all of these standards. But one of the main things is the, the 24, like the, the, the new questionnaire actually en enhances its alignment with critical standards like the IFRS S2 and the emerging TNFD, which for anyone that's not aware of TNFD, that is the task force for nature related financial disclosure. So this alignment ensures that kind of the environmental data that you provide to CDP not only meets global practices, but also positions your company uh, favorably in an environment where kind of investors and regulators are actually demanding some of these high quality and kind of standardized environmental disclosures. So. This strategic alignment kind of helps demystify some of the complexity in the, in, in the sustainability reporting landscape, and also kind of provide a clear pathway for compliance with, you know, the SEC ruling, the SSR, CSRD in Europe and so forth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I yeah. might just want to talk a bit more about that last point too, because I think it's a, a really great point for organizations that are you know, maybe on the fence about reporting to CDP or want to kind of use it as a, a jumping off point that it, in aligning to an, an actual report in CDP, it's actually allows you to also, you know, rather simply and, you know, as, as simply as, as corporate reporting can be also aligned to some of those other frameworks that I, I think it's something that we see certainly with uh, the customers we work with that, you know, there is going to be a lot of them are affected by regulatory reporting and using the CDP questionnaire and, and kind of framework really sets them up for success later on with those types of regulatory reports. Just before we kind of move on, a few notable mentions here on kind of some key updates as well with the CDP is kind of the enhanced detail on risk management. So one of the main themes with CDP is it not only focuses on risks and opportunities, but also looks at your dependencies and impacts on nature. Again, which is also derived kind of from the recommendations in the TNFD guidance. And then another one would be kind of the, the, bio, the introduction of biodiversity and plastics, 
So again, you know, recognizing the interconnect interconnectedness of environmental challenges, kind of the, 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 the purpose of the CDP was to actually expand the questionnaire to include these sections to have this more holistic approach. Anything to add there, Mitch? Yeah, all great points. And I think it kind of showcases, you know, and this did come up at the, the conference in New York as well, the, the direction that CDP is headed with not only aligning with those standards, but maybe expanding the scope a little bit in terms of what they're collecting and, and requiring of companies to report to really make an informed kind of ranking or rating and decision-making process for people that are providing the data to. Well, next section, we'll be talking about activity classification system or short for ACS. Uh, before starting to discuss the CDP, one of the things uh, you need to determine is the sectors you operate in. So. In here, we'll kind of discuss one of the integral components of the CDP framework, which is the ACS, which is kind of pivotal for aligning your disclosures with the specific environmental impacts and operational activities related to the sector that you actually, or sectors that you actually operate. Uh, so one of the things, if you're, if, if this is your first time kind of disclosing to CDP is actually kind of understanding or familiarizing yourself with the, with the terminology here and kind of understanding the, the CDP ACS system. So this, the, the ACS categorizes companies based on primary activities through which you generate revenue, right? So the classification directly influences the type of questionnaire sectors assigned to each company. And by that, you kind of ensure, or CDP kind of ensures that every company that's reporting to CDP receives a very tailored questionnaire that reflects the specific environmental footprint and the business model. So this approach you know, really make sure that the data collected is, is both relevant and strategic to both, you know, yourself as, as, a, as a reporting company that's trying to, you know, hop on kind of your sustainability journey and as, as well as kind of any investors and regulatory bodies that actually care about kind of the, the disclosures that you're actually providing to the CDP. Yeah, and, so, and actually, I think this is a perfect time to address one of the, the first questions that came in too. This question came in, it says, by streamlining reporting so that one questionnaire covers climate, water, and forests, are all entities other than SMEs required to report slash make disclosures on those topics? What if those topics are not relevant to your business? I think that's exactly what the ACS looks to accomplish with basically how you answer those questions will determine, you know, A, the, the sector that you're in, but also B, that you do have to respond to. Want to add any more color there, Hassan? So yeah, th that is exactly what the ACS does, right? So it, it really helps you determine how, like what the questions are going to look like as part of the CDP questionnaire that you actually receive, right? So uh, you get a tailored version that represents your business model and your operations. Moving on to kind of understanding how ACS allocates kind of these, these questionnaires or kind of the sectors to your business. The ACS kind of uses a revenue-based activity assignment. So each company's engagement with CDP starts with the classification of its activities based on where it's making its revenue, right? So one of the main things is, so for example, a company with multiple lines of business will see that its primary revenue generating activity dictate its co like the core of its environmental reporting. And I'll, I'll get into uh, a quick example to kind of highlight, you know, how that actually works. So for example, let's consider like a multinational company, which operates in, in kind of a few different sectors and primarily generates its revenue, let's say around 80% of its revenue for manufacturing electronics. So if we kind of reference the ACS system here, the primary activity or, you know, primary sector that would, it would be classified under would be manufacturing electrical and electronic equipment. And what that means is this company will actually receive a very tailored uh, questionnaire that actually targets that specific sector, which is kind of the electronics manufacturing sector. And that is kind of the, the, the main things about kind of understanding the, the, the ACS allocation and kind of how that, what you disclose and how, can it, and how you actually disclose it to CDP. Any flavor that you'd like to add there, Rich? There's another question just came in too that said, are we able to toggle off on forestry if we don't report through there? And, and basically, the answer to that is all based on, on your ACS, that depending on your specific sector, primary revenue generating sector, that's going to determine whether or not you have to respond to that. And same goes, you know, 
it, of course, if you're a SME, that doesn't apply to you because you're just doing the climate responses. But yeah, it's, it's not like you can toggle off or, or select and choose. It's all based on your industry and your sector. Yeah. And one more thing to add on the SMEs, as I mentioned kind of earlier, for SMEs, the questionnaires will be focused on climate change. Water and forest won't be a major topic for SMEs. To, to kind of round this off, why is the ACS important? Primarily because it impacts how you actually get scored by CDP. So it's very important to note that your primary activity, which you know most of your revenue comes from, according to the ACS, not only shapes your questionnaire, but also shapes your scoring within the CDP system. So this focus ensures that actually companies are being evaluated in areas that align closely with their major environmental interactions and challenges. And again, to kind of tie it back to, to the earlier point, this is really important for investors and regulatory bodies and for your company itself to actually focus on kind of the metrics that actually make sense to your business model in your sector. All great points, Hassan. And I think, yeah, the, just understanding that the ACS is going to kind of shape what your questionnaire looks like, your impact and your scoring, I think has been, it, to me, is a good shift from CDP. Because I think historically, having just that call, that one general questionnaire that everyone gets, there are definitely sector specific call concerns or a piece of information that the various sectors really care about and investors and you know, tons of different stakeholders want to see. And by having the general questionnaire, didn't really highlight that. And, you know, with the responses to allows organizations to take a more strategic focus by, you know, focusing on what is important in their sector, both with the responses and also the strategy and what they're putting in place in terms of a, a sustainability roadmap. Next, want to talk about how to prepare or what you can do to prepare for CDP reporting. Um, first and foremost, you know, if you are a SME, and I think quite a few folks in the audience here today would fall into that category. First and foremost, go through the questionnaire, knowing and understanding, you know, that eligibility and applicability, what is going to be required for your reporting is certainly going to be the first step. Next step after that is understanding what a questionnaire will look like. Again, if you're not a SME going through the ACS and determining what those questions are, uh, I think a lot of folks historically have just been reporting to climate. I would say that's probably one of the more common questionnaires that people were responding to. So understand what the new integrated questionnaire means for your organization. What are going to be the, the key topics and metrics you're going to have to respond to, especially if you're doing water and forests for the first time. Once you've done that, you know, the data collection side of things and starting to, to pull the data together is a, it, you need a plan <laughs> that it, it, there is a lot of data. There is a lot of things that you're going to have to collect and report on. So making sure that you've got a plan in place, you, you've pulled in the right partners, you're working with the right organization members to get that data in a meaningful way. And that, you know, you're also keeping track of and monitoring that, that deadline for the submission. The other thing is make sure you're staying updated on the CDP and new technology. That's the other thing that's new this year from CDP is that it is a, it's no longer ORS. They have a, a brand new reporting system. So I would say you know, working with a technology partner or working to understand that portal better for your reporting, is going to be new for this year and something you want to make sure you're getting ahead of and not waiting to the last minute. I think that's, if I had one piece of advice for this whole process, you know, it's, it's start early. I think that right around CDP deadline or that CDP deadline, things can certainly become a little hectic if you're not prepared for it. Anything you want to add there, Hassan? I'd love to maybe kind of follow up with a question here and, you know, considering the streamlined process for, you know, for SMEs with the new integrated and kind of with the new questionnaire that CDP is actually putting out specifically for uh, SMEs, how do you think it will impact the readiness of those smaller companies to engage with the CDP reporting season? And then what do you think are some additional support that they might actually need to help streamline this process? Really good question. I, I think that I, I do like the approach of, of having, um, uh, having it be a, a SME questionnaire, because I think it, oftentimes the, call it the larger questionnaire or the, the more general questionnaire that we've had historically has almost made it seem probably too daunting, if you will for larger organizations and, and by having the streamlined or having the, the SME 
pathway. Now, I almost equate it to similar to, to what SBTI did with their SMB or SME pathway that you can follow, that it makes it more approachable, that it makes it so that, you know, if organizations before were either worried about not answering certain questions or getting a bad grade or things like that, by having it as a streamlined questionnaire and focusing on the, the key material, things that need to be reported for SMEs, lowers that barrier to entry and makes it more approachable. And second part of that question about what organizations can do to prepare what the, they should be doing now. I, I would say if you are thinking about reporting to CDP or, you know, sometimes it can be a, you have to report CDP. I know there are certain organizations and certain sectors. I think pharma is a good example. Same with retail where they're requiring suppliers to report to CDP. And if you do fall into that category, first take a, a handle on or get a handle on what internal resources you have and what capacity you have within your organization. And if you don't have the capacity to take it on internally, look for partners, whether that be through a software platform like ours, working with various other organizations to basically support you and, and get that data together because it is a lot of work. Make sure you've got the right partners identified if you don't have the internal resources to cover it on your own. And maybe just a, a, follow, a quick follow-up question on the stakeholder engagement. You know, we all know that's a very daunting process. Can you actually share an example of how proactive stakeholder engagement can actually significantly influence the outcome of the reporting process and kind of the, the, how, how it could potentially streamline this, this CDP reporting process and generally speaking. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think you're thinking about, I think I'm thinking about the same project you're, you're, you're referencing, but I, I think one of the biggest things for that stakeholder engagement is having that plan in place that you've got the stakeholders identified. So, you know, for example, who has access to, let's take a, a, Pretty straightforward example, like doing your, your scope one and two emissions to be able to report. You know who has access to the utility bills. You know where that lives within your organization. And I think oftentimes sustainability professionals can approach it almost like they're in a silo or that, you know, it's just me and I need to get this data and I need to, to go and, and pull this. But the, the piece of advice I would have there is, is really identify who those stakeholders are and pull in other folks or other organizations, departments in your business to support in some of this. A lot of times that kind of support can be driven kind of top down from maybe executive leadership having an eye on this and, and being involved in that reporting process that, you know, they can really facilitate that stakeholder side of things. And other times it can be bottom up that you're identifying and pulling in resources as a, a sustainability professional and really documenting the, the process on a who owns the data that we need to, to do, who has the decision making power or who can inform the decision making for what we're going to be putting into our responses and making sure that they're brought through this journey with you. That I, yeah, it becomes more challenging definitely when you're trying to operate within a, a silo and not pulling in stakeholders from across the organization that can really enable you to have a, a much stronger response and B, make the decisions that need to be made, for example, for any of your sustainability strategy to actually have it implemented. Also want to talk about, you know, on that same vein of who you're working with and, you know, if you are looking for support and help, one of the things we wanted to highlight is the ASBs or accredited solution providers. So CDP actually has a list of organizations that, that they've partnered with or, and that they've added as, as accredited solution providers. And this list is one I, I would take a look at if you are looking for that extra support or extra help to actually do the reporting. We are on that list too. Sustain Life is, a, is an ASP with CDP. And the real value of this, and, and one of the things you want to make sure when you're choosing a, a partner is to make sure that they have kind of the expertise and can enable you to report and respond to the, the questionnaire in a, in a timely manner, but also can provide the advice and guidance on what data is best, how do you best show up to these responses, and really guide you through that process. There's also ASPs that can, through on the software side, have APIs set up directly with CDP like we do. So data can be pushed into or pulled out of their system automatically, which can save you a lot of time. Definitely on the reporting side of things, you know, thinking mainly about carbon accounting at this point, but also some of the other data points that the CDP is, is requesting. The more streamlined and less kind of manual entry you have to do, the better and less painful the process will be. But last thing I'll, I'll say is, yeah, that strategy piece is really important. That uh, the CDP report as a whole and, and the responses that you put in shouldn't just be a one-off exercise. The ways that I've seen it be 
most successful is it's built really around your sustainability strategy, that the way that you're showing up to investors, to internal, external stakeholders with these responses really should be, it really allows you to frame a long-term roadmap and true sustainability strategy, because you know, it's something you're going to have to be, well, if you are continuing to report to CDP, that you're going to be sharing updates on your plan and what is being done year over year. Think about them as, as KPIs in terms of those numbers. And that type of approach can really be facilitated through this reporting process. So I, by working with, with someone that can best guide you through the process, not only are you going to have potentially a better uh, response to CDP, but also have a better have better alignment across your organization in terms of what the strategy looks like for your sustainability program. I want to talk about climate risk now too. It's something that was funny when uh, we were preparing for this webinar. This um, it, to me, it still feels like like it was one of the the major additions uh, a couple of years ago. And, and I thought it was you know very recently, and then we found out it was 2018. <laughs> but uh, th this change, I think, is it happened back then. But it's something that is you know with alignment, for example, TNFD with alignment to some of the various other frameworks and or organizations focusing on climate risk more when you know, they have to respond to it. It's something that's, that's really key for reporters and responders that basically want to cover some of the strategies in terms of how organizations can incorporate that in a more meaningful way with their responses and, and what they're ultimately responding to C CDP. With the climate risk in, in particular, like the risk identification and assessment process is to me, again, kind of one of the first steps and key cornerstones for what you're evaluating and, and how you're integrating climate risk into your broader sustainability strategy. The, the advice here would certainly be to assess these climate risks comprehensively, evaluating both physical and transitional risks in a meaningful way that, it, to me, the, the key success point or one of the, the key outputs is that anyone within the organization or, or any of the stakeholders can understand what you mean when you're identifying these risks and what these risks really mean to your business. You want to make it, and, and I think integrating that into your business strategy overall is really a win-win for uh, your sustainability program as a whole. That next piece, or, or once you've identified those risks, focusing on mitigation strategies is a, a key point of, of the whole process that not only are you going to identify risks, it's what are we actually going to do to mitigate these risks, making sure that, you know, certainly from a carbon perspective, that you're focusing on cutting emissions and potentially setting science-based targets or finding a way to, to meaningfully prove and show decarbonization across your value chain is a, a real key point of success and a real key point that it's not only just identifying the risks, but putting the, the plan and action in place to actually start to, for example, start to decarbonize or limit the risk that you're seeing both physical and transitional from climate change. Um, Sam, do you want to maybe talk a bit more about adaptation strategies? I know it's something that you spent a bit of uh, work on recently. Absolutely. Just before kind of we get into adaptation, I think on the mitigation strategies, you know, setting a science-based target uh, is easy. However, implementing those reductions and setting up that right strategy to actually implement those reductions can be uh, quite tough. Again, once you've identified and assessed those risks, mitigation strategies, you know, come in different flavors. And, you know, on the scope one and two side of things, it could be a bit simpler. However, on the sc scope three, it's a lot more complex. But again, so much much what Mitch said, cutting your emissions is very criti critical to actually reach that 1.5 degrees Celsius, good, which essentially all of these frameworks and regulatory bodies are actually trying to achieve, right? It's the limit that global warming to 1.5 degrees C. Now, what if you can't mitigate, right? You need to somehow adapt to the ever evolving climate that we're actually experiencing right now. So with Adaptation, what we mean by ad adaptation here is actually building resilience with better infrastructure and a diversified supply chain. So what does that mean? So let's say, let's take an example where one of your buildings could be prone to flooding and maybe you don't have any mitigation options in, at, at that point. So is there a, like a, an option to actually adapt to the more frequent flooding by, for example, installing 
barriers, like flood barriers or something similar, right? So that is kind of what we mean by adaptation. And again, the goal here is to actually focus on mitigation. However, when you can't do that, you need to actually resort to adapting to actually the, the, the current situation. And one of the main ones is actually diversifying your supply chain. Again, putting all of your eggs in one basket might not be great at that point. So kind of ensuring that you actually have a diversified supply chain. So, you know, pulling your, for example, your, your critical raw material from different sources, instead of just relying on one source that could be prone to heat waves, floods, droughts, and so on, right? So building that resilient supply chain infrastructure is very critical as, as one of your adaptation strategies here. Yeah, now, no, yeah, very, very key point. And I think that's, yeah, mitigation is always the first part of it. And having a strong response on the CDP questionnaire on that is, you know, one of the things that I think the overall client risk is, is seeking to address through the various frameworks and through the reporting. So making sure that, you know, it, that it kind of goes back to the point I was talking about earlier that with the CDP response, it really allows you to build in this element of climate risk mitigation and adaptation into your broader sustainability strategy and have something to track and measure year over year that, you know, you're going to be reporting CDP. You go through the process of identifying both your, your climate risks, physical and transitional risks, and then building a strong strategy and then able to share that with stakeholders year over year. And, and at its core, I think that's for the, you know, the sustainability teams within organizations. That's one of the key KPIs or, or goals in, in terms of building that strategy and being able to track and monitor its success year over year. Last yeah, point we'll just highlight is in, in the actual disclosure reporting, this again is, is where you're going to be doing that ongoing monitoring and measurement of your specific program. So we've done a lot of talking about what the updates are and what CDP added and what this means for organizations that are going to be reporting. I want to spend a bit of time on what are the steps you can take to have a successful CDP submission. To me, kind of back to that, that same point I mentioned earlier, but really you want to have the right preparation and planning in place to make sure you're going to be successful. That submission or due date for that submission, you know, it, it comes up quick every year. It's one of the things that, you know, you shouldn't wait until crunch time to, to have basically kind of pulling those numbers together and, and getting the reporting done. I would say the sooner you can get started, the better. Really start with familiarizing yourself of the new requirements, then go ahead and, and form a team around that submission, making sure that you've got all the right stakeholders that are there to help, for example, with the decision making, with the data collection, with the analysis side of things and overall strategy for your organization. Hassan, do you want to talk a bit more about data collection? I know it's something we've been doing a lot of right now. Absolutely. Who doesn't love data collection? So, you know, data collection doesn't only come from the bottom up, but also from the top down. And what I mean by that bottom up is, you know, you're collecting all of your utilities, all of your, you know, your, your, your finance data and accounting data and your travel data and so on. But also part of a major part of the CDP reporting is actually reporting on things like risks and opportunities and your governance and what your strategy looks like and what your risk management looks like. And these kind of typically come from a top down, right? So it could be your CEO, your, 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 your risk officer, your CFOs. So all of these kind of providing input on how to actually report to CDP. So again, this is a more streamlined process as part of the new integrated questionnaire. So again, eliminating some of the duplicative er efforts that had to happen by reporting separately to the climate module and the forest and the water. Uh, so again, collecting that data early on is very critical to actually having a successful CDP submission. Yeah, no, really good call. And I think the thing that data mm -hmm. collection just to highlight too is that the more time you have with the data, the more checks. And uh, that's the only other thing I would call out too is is getting high quality data is going to be super important to inform A, your submission to CDP, but B, your overall decarbonization pathway strategy and, and what your organization can do from a sustainability lens. The, the more data you have, the better informed you'll be. And that, you know, unfortunately usually requires a, a bit of effort to collect and, and gather that data. And, you know, leads right into the, the second point about internal engagement, that making sure you've got the right stakeholders identified across your organization and that CDP can be elevated a bit 
with CDP training, for example. So something we see pretty commonly is is having kind of like a sustainability training or something that is, is shared with the other departments across an organization and including CDP as an element of that so that people can know, hey, if I'm ever curious about what our company's stance on XYZ is or or what we're doing in the space, you know that they that that report is accessible and that they can see and, and get an understanding of what's going on and see how they can get involved. Yeah, blasting is the actual implementation and making sure that your responses are aligned with your overall sustainability goals and making sure that that, again, gets integrated to your overall sustainability strategy, like I mentioned earlier. And just one more thing to add there is the, the new questionnaire is designed to actually reflect strategic alignment with international standards like, you know, the IFRS S2 and the TNFD, which makes it kind of critical to integrate these into your environmental policies, right? So updating your strategies to actually reflect this holistic environmental performance would be required to actually ensure that your response to, your, like your responses to CDP can be directly tied to, you know, your operational practices and the outcomes. And then actually being applicable to all of the other frameworks that you might be reporting to. I want to just wrap up with some key takeaways and make sure we have enough time to get into the Q&A section of today's webinar. But from the key takeaways, yeah, biggest one is that the CDP has integrated the climate, water, and forests, and it's a, a updated questionnaire and that, you know, it, it is dependent on your industry. It's, you know, something again going through and, and figuring out the applicability and making sure that you're unaware of the what is going to be required of your organization report this year, especially if uh, you've been reporting in previous years, something we've we've commonly seen in some of the, the customers we're working with now, they've historically just been reporting to climate. And that's going to be, you know, the addition of the, the water waste, or sorry, the water and forests sections is, is kind of top of mind for them. And just familiarizing yourself with what that means for your organization and, and what you're going to have to respond to. The next thing is around the ISSB aligned standards and SME focus. And that kind of new, call it pathway or questionnaire and, and what that means, um, especially for small organizations that have not yet ported to CDP, knowing that this is now available, um, may increase the, the likelihood that people are going to report, which I think is a great thing overall. Uh, another thing to highlight is, yeah, if you are looking for external help, focusing on ASPs, uh, those that have reported to CDP before that can guide you through the process that you can work with directly to help with that CDP submission. Other thing to highlight is the activity classification system and the methodology that comes with it. Making sure that, again, you're familiar with it, that you know what the classification system means for your organization and, and what it's gonna mean in terms of the questionnaire, as well as getting ahead of scoring. Scoring is a big part of what the, the value driver is for your organization too, and, and knowing what that looks like in, in terms of how you're gonna be scored can really be used to, to help inform your responses and an overall strategy you want to take. Um, last thing I just want to wrap up with is proactive strategies and the sustained life integration and, and work that we do with CDP can help address some emerging risks. We talked a bit about climate risk as a, a key focus area, both for the CDP submission and your overall sustainability strategy. Again, working with the right partners can really help with success. And at the same time, making sure that you're meeting both your call it regulatory requirements or voluntary reporting requirements like CDP. Go ahead and pull up the Q&A list. First question is, is there a specific ACS for fully remote companies? Yeah, not great question. Oh, go ahead. Oh, please go ahead, Mitch. I was going to say not specifically fully remote yeah. companies, but the, it is, again, sector specific. So thinking about companies that are more likely to be fully remote, I think, you know, that there could be an inclusion of certain elements of that. But yeah, in terms of the, the classification, it's, it's based on sector, not on the actual operations of the organization. If this would be, next question is, if this would be the first year we report, do we get graded or are there any limits on the grade you can get? And do you want to take this one, Asan? Sure can. Yeah. So if you're, if it's your first time reporting to CDP, you can actually have your submission set this private. And what that means is you get graded privately. So no one can actually see what you got for that specific CDP submission. Again, this is only, you're only eligible for this for the first year. Otherwise you would have to publicly report your 
a publicly report and then get graded publicly. So everyone that can, that has access to the CDP portal can actually see your grade. And, and no, there aren't any limit, limits to the grade that you can get. However, kind of generally speaking for companies that do report for the first time, we typically see a, a grade that kind of hovers between B and, and C. Next question is, what's the new system slash portal used by CDP this year? Is there a name, system, details? What is it? Yeah, so it's a new software system that they're using, and they showcased it at the CDP conference in New York. It, for those of you that are familiar with what ORS was historically, it looks a lot better. <laughs> at least the, the screenshots do. And, and we, we've had a chance to, to take a look at it a little bit further as an ASP and with some of the customers we're working with. I actually can't remember. I don't know offhand if it has a name. I've just heard it called the portal before. Do you know, Zom, that it no. has a, another name? I don't think it does. No, it's just the CDP portal. CDP portal, yeah. yeah. But it just for, again, for those of you that are have been historically reporting and are reporting again this year, just know it'll look different. And, and you know, we're not using ORS to report this year. Next question is, what are the size definitions of SMEs? Do you want to take that yes, one, Hassan? happy to take that. Yeah, so for a SME, You'd be considered as me if your headcount is less than 500 employees and your revenue is less than 50 million. However, for companies that do have a headcount of less than 500 and a revenue that hovers between 50 to $250 million US, CDP recommends that you actually take on the full version. However, you do have the option to actually opt to the SME version of the, of the, of the questionnaire. And then kind of anything beyond 250 million and greater than a thousand employees, you'd be automatically assigned the full version of the questionnaire. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. Um, the next question, and we actually just looked this up the other day to help someone with it, but what are the costs associated with completing the CDP questionnaire? Um, prices have changed. I think it's around 7,500 this year for the response. Um, but. Yeah, it, just a heads up there. This is, this is another really good question. I think speaking to kind of some of our talking points earlier about data quality and what's in the, the CDP responses. Uh, the question is, is there any outside assurance for self-reported numbers? For example, an analyst or audit of the numbers slash GHG calculations provided by a company? Yeah, great question. And, and within CDP, the short answer is, is no. There isn't any uh, validation or verification of those numbers. However, the questionnaire does ask if you've had your numbers verified by a third party. So there is kind of a self-reporting mechanism or a way to, to verify that. It was a topic that actually came up a couple of times during the, the CDP conference in New York, where basically with some of the data potentially being put in in the wrong units, or for example, revenue data sometimes being put in in the wrong currency or not being converted, and seeing some of that data come out and really affecting uh, the numbers that are being used, for example, by customers, by suppliers, there, there was a lot of talk about potentially, you know, having something, some sort of verification within the platform saying, Hey, are you sure about this number based on, you know, the industry averages and, and things that CDP can provide. But right now that doesn't exist within both the portal or anything that, that CDP does provide. There is tooling available, for example, with, within our platform or, or other instances where you can get basically industry averages or intensity factors to kind of fact check or, or double check some of the self-reported numbers. But uh, currently CDP doesn't provide that. Um, next question is how much of the submitted information is public? Sam, do you want to take that one? Yeah, generally speaking, it's the entire disclosure that would be public. It wouldn't be specific sections of, of the questionnaire that would be public or private. So you wouldn't be able to actually assign that. Like CDP discloses the entire questionnaire. Yeah. Yeah. Really good call. And, and, you know, the other comment you made earlier too, is, is another good one to highlight that you can report privately that, you know, if there are concerns about having this data be public for whatever reason, uh, you do have the option to report that data privately. The next question is, does a SME have to answer the same questions that big corporations have to answer? Or if they select they are SMEs, questions will adjust automatically. Do you want to take this one, Hassan? Yes. So SMEs will have a unique questionnaire. And essentially, it is a watered-down version of the full questionnaire to provide that more simplified 
set of questions for SMEs to actually sure. respond. Again, reporting to CDP requires a lot of effort. And what CDP has acknowledged as part of this, this cycle is that SMEs do require a more simplified version of the full questionnaire, yet still maintain some of them, you know, the core functionality and the integrity of, uh, integrity of the full questionnaire. So again, the primary questions are primarily the same or kind of the core questions are primarily the same. However, things like forest, the climate are not included for SMEs. So for SMEs, the focus is primarily on climate questions and that is, you know, your emissions and that sort of stuff. Perfect. And that is all of our questions for today. If you think of anything else, feel free to add them into the chat and we'll be sure to follow up and, and answer any questions that, that may trickle in or any thoughts you might have afterwards. Assam, I want to thank you so much for your time today and everyone on the webinar.